Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're really glad that you've joined us and we're going to talk about all things related to plants and landscaping and whatever comes up. So thanks for staying tuned with us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of ACES. And so I'll answer maybe perennial questions, we'll just have to see, and general vegetable gardening questions. But we have three highly talented very knowledgeable folks here on the set with me and let's find out who they are one at a time and they're going to also show you some tips some plants and some other things as we go along so let's go first to you kent miles thanks diane uh, my name is kent miles and i am a uh, owner of illinois willows we are a specialty cut flower grower in western champaign county uh, tonight uh, i brought a couple show and tells uh, some different types of things that you might have in your yard that we're harvesting at the moment. Uh, this here is the um, Helleborus orientalis. It's the uh, Lenten rose. They will generally uh, start to bloom, uh, send up their flower stems in February and March. Uh, the foliage uh, stays green year round and uh, they'll stay in bloom for two to three months. Uh, we generally will harvest ours closer to this stage compared to this one. Uh, this one is uh, a little more immature. It has the pollen and the stamens uh, forming on it. Um, we harvest it later because at this stage uh, there's a greater chance of the uh, stem wilting. At mm -hmm. this stage it's more mature. Uh, the blossom is a little more leathery in touch and uh, I've had it in the house going on three weeks now, about two and a half, three weeks. So it's a long lasting wow. cut flower. And then this other item here is uh, a viburnum. Uh, it's Opus rosum. Uh, it's a st sterile variety that doesn't go to seed or form a berry. And um, we harvest it in the green stage, which is how it is today. And uh, if left on the plant, they form a nice baseball size, kind of a snow white blossom. And that's where it gets its name, Snowball Viburnum. The two of the uh, that you brought in mm -hmm. look so great together yeah. also. Yes, that's yeah. really a great combination. It's beautiful. And the green undertone in both mm -hmm. looks good. And by the way, Kent is an excellent floral designer. I just oh. happened to throw that in there because I have seen you in action. It's really great. So thank you for showing us. You're those. welcome. Thank you. Okay. Now let's go to you, Marianne Metz. Thank you, Diane. Uh, my name is Marianne Metz. I'm a horticulturalist and landscape designer and can currently be found at Prairie Gardens in Champaign. And what I would like to share with you this evening is um, some tips on what to put in a shade garden because everybody knows about hosta. Um, I do collect hosta and have a, a fair number in my yard, but I'd like to show you some color and texture that, that you can absolutely put in your shade garden. And it's not hosta. Not one of these are hosta. And this is this is just a, a small a palette. small sampling of, of of what you can put into your garden. There's just so so many different colors and textures and this is I know heuchera. So talk about some of them. Coral bells, uh, the coloration in the leaves of, of old fashioned coral bells has changed considerably. There is so much going on in this this particular genus right now just fabulous. One of my favorites, I believe this one is called Stoplight. Um, sh just really bright yellow with purple veining. I just love it. I think it's gorgeous. Um, ferns, people don't think about uh, color in ferns. Mine wilted just a tiny bit, but lady ferns particularly. I, I, I love lady ferns. They have such a silvery blue coloration, some nice purple veining in them. Just really lovely. And so many different etiatums. Did you say that right? <laughs> nice texture. Say it with confidence. I yeah. think. Yeah, go for you it. You would have loved it, huh? <laughs> um, arums, different different kinds of arums. I have a particularly peculiar arum, but um, it might be diseased. I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Um, oh, and this one wilted too much to show, but it's a shredded umbrella plant. Um, oh yes. And it it really looks like it's it's spent, but I and I didn't cut it that long ago, but it really didn't hold well. But really a beautiful shade plant. Just so many textures and colors you can put in the shade with your hosta or instead of hosta. Okay. Boy, that was a nice color contrast and they would look good with Kent's 
plants as well. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. they would the just complement each other very well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, now we're going to go next to you, Dr. Jim Appleby. And I'm an entomologist at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Now, Diane, over the many years that we've been on, for I guess 25 years now. Yes, just about. We've had many, many questions concerning voles oh, and yes. moles. And I'll tell you, this year I developed a terrible vole problem in my rock garden. These little voles love to make tunnels underneath the rocks and then they push out the soil. They're like little miniature groundhogs and they cause quite a bit of mess. So I thought, how am I going to solve this problem? I could, I could use uh, traps, but then, you know, when you use traps, there's always a chance you get birds in the traps. I didn't yeah. want to do that. Put poison out. Well, they're vegetarians. So I thought a lot of the poisons wouldn't work. And not only that, but other animals can pick up the poison. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, well, you know, most rodents hate cats and fear cats. So I have two house cats and have plenty of droppings and urine clumps. So I thought, I wonder if I just throw some of those droppings in the holes, up maybe one or two, and then a urine clump. See what happens. I did that, Diane, and for two and a half weeks, I have not had any bull activity at all in there. Two and a half weeks. You have to what show your show and tell. And oh yeah, and then you <laughs> know, show and tell. Every cat owner knows what this is. But then you know, just scoop some up, take it out in the garden. And it really has worked. For so two those voles weeks. have just skedaddled because. Well, of you the... know, what if you were a vole and you had, you know, found this out at your entrance? You think, man, I'm getting out of here. This cat's really vicious. It's after me. <laughs> after Very me. interesting. So if you have that experience, maybe email or put something on Facebook so Jim can. I'd really be interested. Hear I'd really be interested in you know, If you have the same. Yeah. Result. And it's a nice conversation piece. If you don't have a cat, just go to the owner who has a cat and say, could I have some of your graphics? <laughs> and they would say, what? Yeah. <laughs> but then you tell them why. Yeah. And then they'll probably try this with and their own so no. Well, Jim, keep learning. That's all I can oh, say. That's sure. what this show's about. Keep learning. All right. Well, join me on Thursday, May 25th for a Mid-American Gardener field trip. We're going to visit Danville Gardens for a very special gardening demonstration. <coughs> then we're off to Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana for a time with Shane and his favorite perennials. And you'll have time to shop at both places. Then it's back to Campbell Hall for dinner and then a seat in the live studio audience for the 25th anniversary episode of Mid-American Gardener. 25 years, think about it. After the show, we'll celebrate with coffee and cake and plenty of garden talk. So visit will.illinois.edu slash will travel for more information or call 217-333-7300. So that, that I think will be a great time. So 25 years because Jim and I happen to know that personally. Okay, well let's go to um, the special mag quiz next. <music> During whose presidency was the first White House garden planted? A, John Adams, B, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, C, Barack Obama, D, Grover Cleveland. A, John Adams. The president and first lady, Abigail Adams, planted the first garden in 1800. Victory Gardens later gained popularity when Eleanor Roosevelt planted one at the White House in 1943. Did you folks know that answer? No. We guessed early. We just didn't know who it was specifically. So, but anyway, very interesting. Well, let's go to the phone lines now, and we're going to uh, talk with Logan about planting bulbs on line two. Hi, Logan. Hi there. Uh, I was just wondering. I got some bulbs from a big company by mail order, and the instructions said plant them to one inch or two inches or three inches. And I was not, it didn't make it clear whether that meant from the bottom of the bulb to the surface of the soil or from the top of the bulb to the surface of the soil. Which is it? Well, I'm going to jump in if no one else is Please jumping stand. in. Yeah. <laughs> to the bottom of the bulb. Someone just chatted about it a couple weeks ago, uh -huh. that it's to the bottom of the bulb. And, um, you know, 
that's not very much at the top, you know, above it, but it <coughs> is to the bottom of the bulb. Now for gladiolas, they'll tell you a couple inches. Some of those you can plant deeper because they're a little bit, do you plant gladiolas? No, I don't. But they will be a little bit shaky if mm -hmm. you plant them that high. Right. So you can go deeper. So anyway, someone just, I can't remember who it was, but a couple weeks ago, someone just talked about it. Very good question. And I show a big screen in, in my perennials class and show where it goes, you know, to the bottom of the bulb. Okay. Now let's go on to Peggy's question on line three. And she has a question about weeds and the compost pile. Is that correct, Peggy? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Diana. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I've, uh, of course, I'm careful about not putting any uh, weeds that are in seed mm -hmm. into the compost pile. But I've noticed that with, with dandelions, if you um, cut them or pull them up or whatever, while even there's a tiny little bud, they will go on and flower and turn white. So I don't put dandelions mm -hmm. in either. But I wondered about other flowers. Are those uh, um, like, you know, other weed, little flowering weeds? If you pull them while they're in flower, will they go ahead and go to seed if you put them in the compost? Okay, who would like to address that? Well, I couldn't agree with her more. Absolutely. I think there's a few weeds that are really pernicious and that, that could live on top of concrete. Um, mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't put Creeping Charlie into a, um, a compost pile. I probably wouldn't put any Lysimachia of any kind into um, a compost no pile. No garlic mustard. No garlic mustard. Even when it's just in a flower. In any form. In, in, any, a, yeah, in, in any form, that's any correct. Form. <laughs> I put them in a, a bag and I take them off site. <laughs> <laughs> Suffocate them, yes. I, yeah, there's a, and I, I think, you know, it's a good policy maybe to just to follow um, weeds, noxious weeds of the state of Illinois and, and n try not to put those into uh, your compost pile. Um, we call it curly dock or brown mm -hmm. dock. Sure. Mm -hmm. You never want to put any of that root, not even the leaves, the root will rehydrate. It will never die. It's just amazing. It's kind of like horseradish, isn't it? It, it is. Just, you know, just any little section of it will produce a plant. So It's actually a beautiful dried flower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you want it gone, do not put that root in your compost yeah. pile. Ask me how I know. Because <laughs> I found it rehydrating in my compost pile. <laughs> so now I know not to do it. That was a very good question. And I thank you for that because we want people to compost. And I think most people say if your compost heats up, it should take care of those weeds, but I don't think it does. I don't think it does. I don't yeah. think it will. The seeds, I mean. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, let's go on to Helen's question on line four. And I think I know the answer, but I want you to ask the question, Helen. I would like to know what the name of the purple low growth flower is in the fields throughout the Midwest. It was beautiful this year. Yeah, I mean, yes, it was. It was. I, mean, <laughs> I even stopped and took Absolutely. pictures. <laughs> and so That's great. Uh, let's tell her what it is. If you guys don't, hen I will. It, hen hen bit. Bit. Together yep. we're all saying hen, hen bit. bit. And it is an annual, but if the seeds are still in the field, it will come up. It was, unfortunately beautiful. for the farmers, it, it was, was really, yeah. really across, pretty. Across fierce. the road from me, it looked like a field of lavender. It's yeah. beautiful. Oh, it was just gorgeous. And so I've seen it nice other years, but it seems like mm. it was particularly nice, probably because of the milder winter. Yeah. And so they got started sooner. So thank you, Helen. That is Henbit. Okay. Now let's go on to Hannah. And she has a question on line five. Very interesting question. Go ahead and ans ask your question, Hannah. I have a problem with crawdads. Uh, in other words, I've got large areas that I put new soil down on uh, with grass growing beautifully, and now I've got crawdads uh, making holes in it and digging up those great big mud things that stand up to five, six inches tall. Wow. Mm -hmm. I have them coming up in my vegetable garden yeah. a couple. Yeah. I have uh, one in an open area. Wide row. And I was really surprised because I don't have any streams or ponds or anything near it me. It was moist early on. You probably have crawdads in your neck of the yeah, woods too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have found a lot of times when you hit off the clump, it just goes away. Oh. But I mean, they're still there. I mean, the evidence goes away. They're quite I, large. Mine is. Is it? 
really, he's a big guy. Oh my gosh. Oh, and he's amazing. just made the hole and he's been there for going on this the third spring. Wow. Is that right? Well, yeah. these are new clumps, so okay. mine are not very large. Like, so what should we tell? Do you like tell? lobsters? Well, it's going to be a lobster <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> I mean, they really do. <laughs> they have that look to them. So what should we tell um, um, Hannah to do? Because... I've never had them. I have never had a Three person. Three of the four of us. I find that very interesting. Yeah. yeah, that is really strange. I mean, that's yeah. not that common. No, it isn't. But I've noticed them in a, a raised bed, and and I'm just planting potatoes around them and just watering over. I mean, I'm not. I don't really think they're affecting the the plants uh -uh. or anything. No, oh, they're no. not going to hurt yeah, anything. No. Don't you imagine that in dr droughty times they would have a tendency to go somewhere else? I really do. Or lower, That's, or may, deeper. Yes, or, or maybe deeper. just deeper. I was yeah. going to say, I would think that mm -hmm. you would have... Because what you're yours. seeing is the entrance and, you know, that. Uh -huh. I don't think they care about the entrance except for shade. And so oh, okay. my potatoes are going to shade it if the entrance goes mm -hmm. away. And yours is in an... Mine's just wide open. Wide open? Like in a, in a path. Mine's near okay. a small stream. Okay, so then that, huh. I'm not surprised. Yeah. So I guess you're going to... Maybe want to mark it and just, well, I don't know, it won't hurt anything no. except the way it looks. Or you could harvest them. Yes. And in a, in a lawn, if you mow it, it's going <laughs> to continually, I mean, if it knock builds it, down, it up, you're right. just going to knock it over mm -hmm. again. Very interesting question. Thank you. And, and we have the right folks on to, <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to discuss it. We, don't, we haven't really solved our problem, but we enjoy looking at it, I guess. Okay, let's go to line six, and Velva has a question, ah, about henbit. Hi there, what's your um, exact question about it? Well, I was wanting to know, is that a weed or a flower, and how do you get rid of it? Well, I think a flower is a matter of perception. Anything out of place is a weed. <laughs> I think what we're seeing in the fields is definitely Our, uh, yeah. a serious problem. And certainly, if it's in your flower garden, it will be a problem mm -hmm. consistently year after year after year. In your flower garden, if you can just weed it before it goes to seed, it, yeah, it's as simple as that, except if you don't get it done. But then it is an annual, and it comes up from seed. So it's getting it at the right timing. I always think I'm going to do that, but there's always a few seeds. But so. then there's always the people all of us sitting here who thought it was really beautiful this mm -hmm. year. So, you know, it's... It doesn't stop me from weeding it in my own garden. <laughs> so. Just let it grow somewhere else, right? Yeah. But then if you have it growing somewhere else, it will make its way to your garden. Yes, mm -hmm. it will. Mm -hmm. You know, through birds and whatever and what have you. So weeding, I think, is probably the easiest way to go and then continuing to weed new little seedlings out. So anyway, thank you for that follow-up on that question. We didn't really say how to get rid of it. We just identified it before. All right, let's go to Charles' question on line two about asparagus. Hello, line two. Are you there, Charles? Yes, I am. Okay. What is your question? My question is, when do you stop cutting asparagus? Okay. <laughs> oh, we're all looking around. I'm oh. still in the thick of cutting it, so I haven't pondered you should it. Be, you should be for a They while. will start to, de to decrease in size. Right. And, you know, when they're thinner than a pen or a pencil, that's, that's not funny. a good time. Um, what else should we tell him? I mean, the ones right now are really thick. Mm -hmm. And so they will start to decrease when it gets hotter. He, heat's a good indication, but that's... Yeah. So I would say look at size, look at heat, and you want all of your clumps to have some top growth. So you don't ever want to cut all of them, but how do you know there aren't going to be more coming? That's the question. So <laughs> so there will be more coming, but but I think size is the indicator, number one indicator. So when, the, when, the, when they get too small, when, when they the get stems too get slender. And then just kind of let them mature then. And then you let them mature. Ones. Yeah. It's been a good year for asparagus, mm -hmm. very. Yeah, and if your asparagus is slender to s right now in the prime season, then that means you need to put more nitrogen fertilization on it through either composted manure or just nitrogen in January, February. It's not really good, don't do it now. Uh, but you know, wait maybe more at a dormant season. They're heavy feeders. 
Okay, let's do one more and then we'll go to our show and tell. And Carol has a question about a native Illinois tree or trees on line three. Hi, Carol. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I have Welcome. The, 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 you know, under the canopy, I've got that pamphlet and it shows all the native trees and I'd love to have some of these in my yard, but I, I can't imagine where you can buy them. I've never seen them at a nursery. Do you have to order them? Yeah, some of them would be a little bit, you might know better, Kent. Uh, I think you would be able to get some locally, mm -hmm. um, you know, different nurseries in central Illinois. Um, there are companies that are more Midwest that deal with strictly with natives. Um, there's some in Nebraska, uh, further west on the Pacific Northwest that deal in uh, natives. Um, I think just probably just go off of a, a list of natives and then just s call around or check websites. Yeah, have your listing mm -hmm. of what you're looking what for. What you're looking for. I found a white fringe tree and I was just at a, not right close by, but as I was traveling back home and I just, I put it in my car and brought mm -hmm. it home. So. I wasn't looking for it, but I had it on my list of things to look for. So you might have to, I would think even asking local nursery, they might mm -hmm. end up with them. Mm -hmm. so I think there's not, not too many nurseries lo in, in the central Illinois area that actually grow native trees, per se. They may but get like them Kent in. like Kent said, yeah. yeah, might get them in. I think, as Kent said, there's very close. I, I know some in southwestern Michigan. And that would be a good climate to have them come from, mm -hmm. certainly. And in southern Wisconsin. And yeah, that's uh, where I, I think there's a, a number of them, but m most of them would be uh, you'd have to order yeah. from. So it's worth looking into. Yes, so it get is. your list of favorites and then go from there. Good. That was a great question. Thank you, Carol. Now let's do some emails and we'll start back over with you, Kent. Okay. Uh, we got this email back in February about the middle of the month from Helen uh, Whitney. And she's asking about uh, the recent above average temperatures and that she's worried about the trees and flowers blooming too early. Uh, I had a family member uh, state that they are seeing their tulips at this time in February. Um, we didn't actually have tulips ourselves. We had daffodils poking through it in February. Um, I believe this past February was the warmest on record for the state. Uh, then we got a, went back to a little bit normal temperatures in March. Uh, we personally didn't have any dieback. Um, things kind of made it through. Uh, some things maybe suffered a little, but I think in generally um, most things will recover and send out new growth if there was any dieback. Mm -hmm. So. Um, as far as like flowering plants and uh, bulbs, uh, your tulips, daffodils, narcissus, jungles, um, you know, those types, uh, they always will make it through the snow, even if there's, you know, a little snow cover on top of them, they still will manage just fine. Okay, great, thank you very much. And now Marianne. Well, I have an email from a listener um, who has a bamboo plant in about um, a two foot tall sitting in a pot of rocks and water. So I'm gonna say that it's probably a lucky bamboo plant that a lot of people grow <coughs> inside in um, decorative containers and um, they, they are actually not a bamboo at all, but a dracaena. And as most houseplants go, most of them are affected by salts and fluoride in the water. So that's probably what's happening to the plant that, um, the problem with this her, this person's plant is the leaves are turning brown. So I'm, I'm quite sure that that's what's going on is either the um, chlorine in the water, um, salts in the water, something. Use distilled water and change the water every few weeks or at, at least once a month. Perhaps the browning is from um, a dry atmosphere, especially in the wintertime when our forced, we have uh, forced heated air and it's very, very dry. So uh, the environment around a house plant can not be at all what they like and misting them if occasionally will help a lot. But certainly changing the water and using distilled water would make a huge difference on this particular house plant. 
And a lot of people just leave the brown leaves on. So go or, ahead and... Or just snip the little ends if it's just yes. the end of the leaf. Just yeah. reshape it. Don't have it stay on there because yeah. it really makes it much more noticeable. So anyway, do you have a quick... We're not, we don't have, oh, we don't have much time. Is yours quick or should we wait for another time? We probably should wait for another okay. time. Okay, sorry, Jim, yes, but it does right. go fast, I'm telling fast, you. Yeah. It really does. Thank you to all the viewers. You had some really good questions and uh, interesting things that come up and we're interested in, in hearing about it. Well, thank each of you for being here. We're so happy that you brought all of your expertise and visually showed it. And we hope that you will have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.